As you get closer and closer to the NHL playoffs, betting on money lines, puck lines, and totals gets harder and harder to win money. So in this video, we break down why shots on goal markets may be the way to go and the process in how to beat them. Welcome back to Edgework here on the Hammer Betting Network. And as we've done over the past, we're breaking down different ways to attack betting markets, whether it be shots on goal, money lines, totals, puck lines. We've talked about some futures markets when it was before the trade deadline, after the trade deadline, breaking down some of the different trades that have happened. And today, our resident shots on goal prop betting expert, Todd Cordell from The Score. Todd, last year on the season was 514 and 423 as his record, plus 71 units so far this season, 435 and 397 up, 20.38 units on the season so far this year. Todd, obviously when it comes down to uh, breaking down betting on the NHL, there's different ways people attack different markets. You can bet on money lines, puck lines, as he mentioned there, totals. You get into all of those, but it seems throughout the course of this year on the show, you've kind of found a niche, and especially going into your record in units last year and shots on goal. What kind of made you get into betting on shots on goal props and like focusing on that market and really being able to pick that off? Um, well, basically just the, the totals and sides are just bigger markets where a lot more money has been into it and a lot more people are paying close attention so unless you're playing um, games days in or a day in advance and getting less money down, it's kind of hard to find as big of edges. Um, like there still are edges for sure, but it's in player props. It's a much different story where books are much slower to adjust. Like somebody could hit eight games in a row while piling up a ton of shot attempts and like posting a very strong underlying process and the books won't adjust their price at all or their shot total and they'll just stay and just keep hitting it. So I think there's bigger edges to find and the books are slower to adjust to those edges. So you can kind of hit them time after time before um, anything changes. So a lot of people, when it comes to um, money lines or the sides, the totals, there are people who originate games. We obviously see guys like So Money, Russ, Rob Pozzola here on the Edge Work Show throughout the course of the week. They originate their own games. They're some of the bigger originators in the NHL and they come on talk about things and all of a sudden you see markets moving on that side. And for anybody who doesn't know, originators are people who model the games ahead of time, uh, get their own numbers on things and then they create their own edges based off of that. Now when it comes to shots on goal, there are people who do stuff like that, but there is uh, the everyday person who who maybe they can't originate. They don't have the time to originate or they don't have the capability to originate games. Uh, I'm curious for you, when you're looking at shots on goal, how much of this is originating numbers? How much of this is picking off numbers? Kind of what is your process going into betting into the shots on goal prop markets? Um, so for, for me, I don't uh, have a model. I also don't um, just like price shop for NHL props. I like to do my own thing. I don't just try and pick off one spot where it's minus 110 and everywhere else it's minus 125. I do my own research. So every morning I pull up naturalstatrick.com, uh, go to team shot or team stats, uh, look at shots allowed um, per 60. The last 10 games at five is five. I kind of write down a bunch of players who are facing those teams short sort of as like initial targets. And then once I have a list of targets of guys who I want to look at, that's when I start looking at, 500 different things it's almost like a checklist uh so so like let's say um a player's facing columbus so columbus last 10 games second last in shots allowed uh per 60 minutes giving up a ton of attempts so uh toronto in this case is playing columbus so i would go to toronto's um page on natural stat trick look at shot attempts the last 10 games so Generally, I want players who have taken over 60 attempts the last 10 games. Sometimes I'll make exceptions if it's a, uh, against an opponent like Columbus or Anaheim or someone who just gives up a ridiculous amount of shots. But generally, I want 60-plus attempts. So we see Matthews uh, leads the Leafs with 81 attempts and 55 shots the last 10 games. Um, so then I would go to shotprops.com with a Z. They have these pages where you can see shots allowed per position or versus positions. Um, for the last 10 games or for the season. So I would go to there and I kind of cross-reference the guys who I'm looking at to see where they rank against that position. Um, so if Columbus, for example, 
is eighth from last uh, this year in shots allowed uh, per game versus centers. So I would have Matthews highlighted on my page since Columbus gives up a lot of shots. And then I would sort of check. Um, it'd be a check on my box that they give up a lot of shots that position, especially of late. Right. Um, I also look at history versus the team. So props.cash has a lot of uh, quick tools where you can sort of just click and see any opponent or home away splits, that sort of thing. So if you go to Matthews, you can see the last three games against Columbus, he has seven shots, 11 shots, and five shots. So he's hitting his number. So that would be like another check off his box, so to speak. And then after I have all that kind of laid out where I know a player's in a really good spot and the price is fair, um, it's not like minus 150 or something like where I have to lay a lot of juice. The last thing I would look at is just team circumstances. So is it like, especially now in the season, some teams aren't playing for anything. Uh, some teams have their matchup locked up. Like the Leafs are playing the Lightning. They can't move up. Um, they probably are not going to move down either. So they're not really playing for anything right now. They're starting to rest guys. So I would be, a, I'm not playing Matthews today because of this. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to get a full workload, especially against a bad team like Columbus, right. uh, where, where they might just go up a couple goals and just kind of ease off the gas and not give him as much ice time. But uh, that's generally how I do it. So order of operations, if you could just kind of recap that quickly in terms of sites and then what specifically you're looking for there, if you could give like a brief summary. So you start natural statric, and the first thing you're looking for there is? Um, the last 10 games, uh, shots against um, rate or shot attempts, sorry, because I think those are more meaningful since there's higher volume. So I look to see which teams are giving up a lot of shots or which teams aren't. So Carolina, for example, Seattle, teams like that, they're always at the top of the list. Like they never give up anything. So generally speaking, I pretty much just cross off whatever players are facing those teams because especially Carolina, they have a really good penalty kill. I don't want to be in a situation where I need three, four or five shots against them because they just don't give them up. So I sort of look at the worst teams in that regard. And then I highlight like the main shooters on those teams on a Excel sheet. So like for Tor uh, Toronto tonight, they're facing Columbus. So I'd write down uh, Nylander and Matthews. Those are the only two that generally fit my criteria. Or sorry, Tavares as well. And then I would go to shot props, look at how um, the team they're and facing. And this site is called what? Sorry, shot, shot props. props with a Z.com. Okay. <laughs> and then they have year to date numbers and last 10 numbers against position. So I could, if Columbus, obviously they're not good defensively, but let's say they're, 28th against right wings, but they're second in uh, shots against the centers. So I'd scratch off Nylander and I'd be like, okay, I'm down to Matthews and Tavares. And right. then, as I mentioned, I would look at team circumstances where if uh, it's a big game or they're trying to be the number one seed or that sort of thing, I would have more confidence back in them than uh, right now where the Leafs are kind of just playing at the string of games. And nothing really matters. So generally for guys, I prefer a lot of their volume to come from five versus five since most of every game is played at five versus five, but there are certain players, um, basically all the guys you'd think of like Pashnak, Ovechkin, Rantanen, Zabinijad, those sorts of guys who get fed one timers and such on the power play um, where I think the matchup for power play is really important. So for those players, um, especially there's two things I look at. So one is, is their opponent the last 10 games or on the season, uh, if you'd prefer a bigger sample, do they take a lot of penalties? Like the Vegas Golden Knights, for example, have spent an average of three minutes and 10 seconds on the PK the last 10 games, which is bas basically nothing. They don't take any penalties. So if I need, I'm backing Ovechkin and his power play shooting is a big reason why, then I don't want him to be facing a team like Vegas that doesn't take penalties. Um, well, on the flip side, if you're facing the Coyotes who are dead last in penalties this season and dead last the last 10 games, they take a ton of penalties. So Sabinijad especially, he's not a good 5 versus 5 shooter. He needs to do his damage on the power play. So if he's facing a team like Arizona, I'd be much more inclined to play him. Okay, so question for you then. If you're going to go and try to find this information, um, how many penalties does a team take? How many are they averaging? And then on top of that, you've now found out how many they're averaging. You found out how many penalties they're taking over the last 10, over the, last, over the course of the season. How do you find out the volume of shots a player generates on the power play Rate five on five. Is there anywhere you could recommend for people to go to to find this info? Yeah, Natural Stat Trick is my go to for pretty much everything that I do with shot props. They have, um, you can sort by penalty kill stats, power play stats, 
um, for team or player. So you can see how many of the attempts, like maybe one player takes a hundred, he's taken a hundred attempts on the power play this year and the closest teammate to him has taken 50. So that just kind of okay. tells you that he's the go-to guy. If you don't watch that team that much or not as familiar. Um, but yeah, natural stat check has all the data for teams on the PK. You can see how many shots they're giving up, how much time they're spending on the PK, all that stuff. So that's definitely my go-to resource for anything shot props. If you, if you're going to use one site to do your research, natural stat check. And uh, so now you dig into this, you find out a team uh, doesn't take that many power plays, but you were looking at Ovechkin and his, uh, his number, a lot of it comes from power play shots. Does this affect, how much does this affect how much you would, uh, interest you would have on playing on an Alex Ovechkin shot prop moving forward with, in this game, that, that specific game in that matchup? Are you going to look at it maybe a little bit differently? Are you going to maybe say, Hey, I'm going to stay completely off this. Like what does your perspective on that player and that prop, how does it alter based on the matchup that they have? Uh, it makes a difference for sure, especially for players like Ovechkin and Pasternak, who generally have really high shot totals. So if they're not going to get power plays and that's where they do a lot of their damage, it really hurts. Um, obviously, there'll be some exceptions. Like if if you're facing Columbus and they don't take that many penalties, it's not a huge deal because they give up so many shots at five or five, like just an insane amount. But let's say it's a mid-tier uh, defensive team in terms of shot prevention, like the Caps. If they're not taking penalties, I'm not looking to play Pasternak over four and a half against the Caps because they don't they play slow, they don't give up a lot of shots, and then if they're not going to take penalties either, it's just kind of a spot where you're where you're forcing things. Whereas again, if you're facing Columbus or Anaheim, you're just going to get so many shots anyways, so it doesn't really matter if the power play opportunities aren't aren't there. Okay, so there you go. You have uh, basically the process of someone who has had a tremendous amount of success betting shots on goal props over the past two seasons. As I mentioned, up 71 units last year, up 20 units so far this season, uh, and uh, continuing on as there are still a bunch of games left in the regular season this year and into the playoffs. Now, Todd, the final thing i kind of interested in here, you've kind of narrowed down your process of, okay, teams to focus on betting players against. Now you've gotten into their which players in these games am I going to bet against now you've narrowed down uh, even further throughout this process you're basically funneling down to get to this point now the final process kind of here that I I'm interested in I feel like people would uh, be interested in how you apply this you're now looking at the betting markets okay so you pull up a player's odds for tonight you look at the shots that they're listed at how much does the probabilities and the odds actually factor into what your decision of playing this? Um, you've looked at the shots on goal and you've made a determination yourself of kind of where they might slot in at, but you're looking at, okay, this player is minus 150 on over three and a half shots on goal, 145 tonight. Somebody might look at this and say, wow, that's a lot of juice that I have to lay on this. Where do you kind of slot in in terms of actually laying these prices and where do you feel comfortable? How do you determine what you are and aren't okay with in terms of the odds on these shots on goal props? Yeah, so for me, it depends a lot on what the shot prop itself is, like what the shot total is. I'm more comfortable laying juice if the shot total is lower than if it's higher. Like, for example, I would rather back Adrian Kempe, who checks all my boxes um, at minus 150 for three shots than I would Austin Matthews for over four and a half shots because he just needs so many that if the game's not competitive or what have you, like there's too much that can go wrong when you need a high total like that. Right. So I'm more inclined to lay the juice if it's two and a half, especially that's kind of um, the number that I really like. Um, whereas again, if it's four and a half, you need so much to go right. You need power plays. You need the game to be close that I, I'm less likely to um, lay the juice for a bigger prop like that. And last thing that I'm going to ask you, it's obviously something that recreational people joining the market are now, we're seeing a lot from them. Uh, you throw together these lottery ticket parlays. There's 20 guys to get shots on goal props all mixed into one here. Uh, now, parlays is something that we've discussed uh, throughout the course of the show. You can hear it on Circles Off, also on the Hammer Betting Network, talking about in certain circumstances, there are good ways to go about betting parlays and putting things together and they can be a fine way to do it as long as you know what you're doing in certain circumstances you've done it so far on the edge work show this year a few different times where you've combined some of these player props these shots on goal parlays 
obviously this is something we don't recommend just hammering together five to ten <laughs> player props and and hoping that these things cash but you can find different spots to pick off uh, as well as today on the live show that we did on edgework we did put together a player prop parlay how do you go about determining some value that you can find in these parlays? What's kind of the max amount of players that you'd throw in there? How do you determine what odds you're going to set these things at to find uh, players to put into something? Like, where do you go about building a parlay? And what kind of thoughts would you have on building a shots on goal parlay for, for different players? So if I'm betting real money or like a normal unit size, I definitely wouldn't go more than two players. I would generally like... It'd be, as I gave up in the show today, I like to lurk in against Montreal and Kempe against Edmonton for two and a half. So I combined the two and did a normal unit size for that. But I generally would not go uh, more than two players. Um, another thing I like to do for parlays is just I use it to kind of take some of the juice out of it. So if there's a player I really like and uh, for over two and a half shots and he's minus 140, and I, I would be comfortable laying that price. But some of these books, you can do things where you add their team total over one and a half goal or right. over a half a goal in the first period, something that's very, very likely to hit um, just to kind of get it back to even money. Generally speaking, those are the only kind of parlays I'm betting real money on. Once in a while, um, if there's like, let's Florida especially, they're really good for game stacks because they play such high event hockey. So once in a while, if they're playing, like tonight, they're playing uh, Buffalo Sabres. So that could be a high event game. Once in a while, I'll kind of go through my list and I'll be like, Verhege checks the box, Ekblad checks the box, uh, Pachuk checks the box, bring back somebody the other way, assuming it's a competitive game because your Florida Panthers guys aren't going to hit if it's a 6-1 game. So I'd bring it back, um, maybe a player or two on the other team like Tuck or Skinner um, where it's a high event game. I would do that uh, just sort of for fun, but the unit size would be drastically smaller for that sort of things. Generally think, uh, speaking, I would not bet real money on parlays unless it's two legs. Um or you're just using like something like I mentioned, like a team total over a half a goal or over one and a half goals just to kind of take the juice out of it. Well, there you go. Hopefully this helps people out uh, moving forward. As we get into the playoffs, things will become a little bit tighter to bet on money lines, puck lines. Maybe it'll become a little bit more frustrating, harder to predict what you're going to bet on that night or uh, ability to win games. And finding another market to dive into another market to cheer for essentially as well it's a different rooting interest in a game can be a fun way to go about betting on things especially if you're just trying to have fun with it or you're trying to add a little bit extra money to your pocket especially during the playoff time here so uh, todd is our resident shots on goal prop betting expert he has done very well so far on the show this season as i mentioned so far this year 435 397 up 20.38 units in his own personal betting as well as uh, up so far on shots on goal props on the season tracked on the edgework show so if you do enjoy the content here on the edgework show please make sure to subscribe to the channel like this video drop some comments below if you have any questions in regards to anything that was brought up here today but otherwise look forward to seeing everybody in our daily live streams monday through friday 10 30 a.m eastern time and to everyone who's going to now go forward and bet on these shots on goal props good luck on your bets Thank <laughs> you.